he showed up in some color today and that was a nice that was that was a nice sight but surprise it was a surprise <laughs> Four players by Barstool Sports brought to you by our very good friends at Chevrolet. Go check out a Chevy right now. They are our title sponsor for the entire year. So we love Chevy, the bow tie, the whole deal, EVs for everyone everywhere. Adam Scott's on this show. He's never been on the show. Uh, we spent four hours yet, yeah, uh, Tuesday, I guess it is, about four hours with him. We played a scramble match for most of it. And then we got 45 minutes of the podcast with myself, Trent, Frankie, and Adam Scott for the show. He was excellent. We went through all kinds of good stuff, including Masters stories, what he's expecting at this year's Masters dinner, uh, Champions Dinner. Uh, the Scotty Sheffler menu was just released, so me and Dan can go through that. So stick around for Adam Scott. Obviously, that is kind of the highlight of this show. Uh, spring merch, so we're wearing a little bit of it right now. Um, great line. Our merchandise team works incredibly hard. We got all kinds of polos and hoodies and accessories. We got a women's line, a men's line, all kinds of good stuff. So store.barcelosports.com. Go check out the spring line, flowers, themes. It's about to be nice all over the country, so get pumped up for that. April's the best month of the year. It's not even close, in my opinion. You got the Masters tournament. You got all of good weather to look forward to for like the next six months. It's uh, flowers start to blossom all over the place. You got the Masters tournament. You got the conclusion of March Madness, and then even when Masters ends up finishes up, you've got like I said, months of fantastic weather to look forward to. So I love April. You want to be ready. Golf season. We just had the time switch. We don't do it in Arizona, so I'm three hours behind now, which is an absolute dagger right now. But that is tough. That's why it's just a grind. But um, the rest, I'm exhausted right now. I couldn't get names right. I was using weird words when I spoke with Kirk earlier. I literally went to bed. It's, I think, 6 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so it was a little bit of a grind. But we're here. We're ready to talk some golf. we got a lot to get to because of the uh, proposed rule changes from – uh, the USGA and the RNA, Dan, you posted a great video about it that's got people talking. Uh, I'm sort of been torn on the whole issue personally, and I've been really working for the last 24 hours to kind of educate myself so that I could try to find truly where I fall on the entire situation without being biased in any way. Uh, there's a lot of information and data and history to consider, um, but the USGA and the RNA have proposed um, – essentially to dial back, roll back the golf ball is the best way to say it. It would start in 2026 if it gets, you know, approved, accepted, however the hell you want to describe it. And it would basically roll back the golf ball. It sounds like the driving distance is uh, 20, 25 ish yards. But Dan, you did a good, a great sort of synopsis and breakdown of the whole situation. Uh, pretty big news coming from these uh, governing bodies. Really big news. They've been kind of tiptoeing toward this for a while. I think the timing of the announcement is is kind of rich, given everything else that's going on in the professional game right now. It's just another like huge thing that's going to basically split people down the middle, except for it doesn't really feel like it's down the middle. The way this is breaking down the reaction to this, at least from what I've seen anecdotally in a few polls, is that you know the, the, the kind of um, old school traditionalists have been calling for this for a really long time. They don't like seeing courses become obsolete, places like Cypress Point, places like National Golf Links, these golf courses that were designed at 65, 6,600 yards that are can no longer test the, the best players in the world. Which, so those for guys, the record, those courses, it's not like they were hosting U.S. Opens at those courses. For they a, don't like, want them. That's what I'm saying. That's not uh, – you can kind of tell where I'm starting to go on this whole thing. But but that that part, I was thinking about that all morning, a lot of like, uh, uh, okay, which courses do I – uh, uh, have I heard these incredible tales about these icons of the game in the 20s and 30s and 1920s and 30s winning majors on these courses and hitting these shots that they just aren't able to go back to now? And that's not that didn't exist. Yeah, it's not it's not really a thing. Cypress Point does not want to host uh, the at t Pebble Beach Pro-Am. I, I don't think that's a secret. But yeah, so so that crowd is is is, is it's a victory for them, right? Like they've been calling for this for a long time. Chevrolet is a trusted company that has been innovating for the last 100 years. You see Chevrolet, you see the bow tie, you know what you're going to get. It's an American, beautiful company. And I just, I see them and the hair on the back of my neck just stands up. That's a Chevrolet rolling right by me. Yeah, I see people driving around in Chevys and I think to myself, that person made a good decision. They made a great decision and you can make a great decision by getting a Chevy EV. 
These new electric vehicles are for everyone, everywhere. They're available for all Americans, and that is what Chevrolet is committed to. There's a growing network of public charging stations right now in this country, and you're never going to not have one. You, I, used, I think that used to be a um, downside to getting an EV. Right, people like, are like, oh, where am I going to... What happens where, if I get caught on a long drive? That's not happening anymore. No, there's going to be, within the next, you know... Decade or so, probably even less. There's going to be charging stations all over the place. There's over 1,900 certified Chevy EV dealerships right now in this beautiful country. And Chevy has convenient ways for you to research and shop these EVs online. So make sure you check out from Bolt to Blazer. We saw the Silverado in person. It was an unbelievable electric vehicle. Make sure you check out these Chevrolets, this new line of EVs. Chevrolet, EVs for everyone, everywhere. I think the reaction from players and from most fans that I've seen is just like, no, this is a solution. I think Justin Thomas said a solution to a problem that doesn't really exist. And I understand the guy saying, oh, these guys don't hit long irons into greens. You know, uh, sports change, man. Uh, you know, everything changes and everything evolves. And and do I understand why it would be good, you know, might be advantageous to to take away 20 yards from the top players in the world? Sure. But it has a lot of repercussions you know these the manufacturers are going to have to develop new balls pros are probably going to have to change equipment to match those balls um you know bifurcation is something that golf has never done before having a different set of rules for the pros than the joes it just it it just seemed like the people who were calling for this was such a small portion of of the golf audience that feels like they know what's best and that they know what's good for the future and it, and it is kind of a fascinating uh, you know, dynamic here between the the sort of cognoscenti or the orthodox, you know, these these suits and these people who who talk about, like you said, the the old days of shot shaping, and then you've got eighty five percent of the population that's like, screw this, we're moving forward. Golf's in a great place. Why do we need to do this? So, my my view on this has changed a lot since I moved to Barstool, honestly, and kind of got out of that that echo chamber of oh, you know, the shot values are different. So, I, I, I yeah, I I feel a lot differently than I did about a year ago. I uh, like I kind of set off the top. I, I, you know, I'm I find myself in a position where I I very much am able to empathize with both sort of standard sides of the argument. And the crux of the issue, you know, seems to be that not that long ago, uh, when the ball, the golf ball in particular, but also the other equipment, the drivers, um, all the equipment. Uh, the golf ball in the golf game used to require significant more, significantly more artistry, if you will. It, it, it required to a degree, and Tiger talks about this a lot. What it required was because the ball spun a lot more, didn't fly in the air as far, that in order to play very difficult golf courses well, you had to learn with a significantly larger amount of of skill, of finesse, of artistry, air quotes, if you will, how to shape shots, how to flight shots. And the way and the golf ball has uh, evolved over the last 20 years, and again, this is something Tiger talks about a lot, is that they've really optimized it to fly far with less spin and to come off the face with a, uh, you know, at a higher trajectory so that that golf ball will stay in the air with less spin. It barrels through that air and it goes farther. And so if you are playing a 450 yard par, par four as a professional golfer versus us, right? If we go out there, we're still pretty similar. We're going to get to all this where it's like, if we hit a drive, that's a really solid 270, 280 yard drive or something. We've still got 170, 180 yards in, which for me is like a six iron or something. If I hit an okay drive, I hit it out there 250 maybe. I've still got 200 yards into this difficult par four. I'm probably in the rough. Now I'm trying to hack some four iron up there. It's a very difficult hole for a normal golfer to make a pretty easy four. If you take now the way the game has gone for the top professionals who can fly at 320, 325, 330, 
they get out that driver. They hit it pretty straight. Even if it goes in the left rough, the right rough, even if there's a little bit of tree trouble they have to navigate or if they find a fairway bunker up there, they're only 120, 130 yards out. They've got a gap wedge in their hands, and they can fly that fucking thing onto the green. And the only possible defense is if those greens are firm as hell, which the courses, the superintendents don't have much control over because golf courses are outdoor it's an outdoor sport, and you are just subject to what are ha- whatever happens with Mother Nature. We saw that last week at the Players' Championship where they've got sub-air system. They've got all the control you could possibly have over that golf course to keep it firm and fast, which is the only real defense against these top pros who can now launch it high, fly it high, land it soft, and stop it wherever they want. It rained on Friday night. The course went from playing spicy, fiery, whatever cliche word you want to use, to even with their sub-air, even all that, On Saturday, it was the lowest scoring round in the history of the Players' Championship just because it got wet overnight. And so the the one thing that would allow those that run the events to sort of control score and control difficulty, they really don't have any control over because if it gets soft, when the game has changed the way that it has changed, there's no fucking defense if the guys can just hit it out there, hit a wedge onto the green, stop it at any moment that they want. And that rattles people because back in the day, and here's a great example of like in 1986 when Jack Nicholas won the Masters and he hit that shot right at the flagstick on 16 and he took his head and didn't even watch it because he knew and his son said, be right, he said it is. He hit a fucking five iron in it in 1986. Same tee, same pin, that back left with a knob on the right. Tiger Woods and pretty much everybody else in 2019 when he won hit an eight iron. In. And so that clearly is over whatever that is, 40 years of difference, 43 year difference. That is a massive difference hitting a fucking five iron versus an eight iron. I, I uh, implore anybody out there listening to go to the driver range, hit 15 eight irons and hit 15 five irons. And the difference will be laughable at how obviously much harder it is to hit a five iron than eight iron. If you extrapolate that out across every hole that everybody plays on all of the game, it clearly has dramatically changed the game. Now, having said that, I'm so what hardly right, right. I'm, I'm learning. And I read a lot through Brandel Shambly's tweet thing, which I'm going to go through. and I want to kind of read that. It's really affecting very few holes on very few golf courses. And even if it were affecting all of the holes on all of the golf courses that these guys play, it's an incredibly small size of players. And it is still in line with the evolutions that the game has been making since the 19 teens. There are quotes from the greats of that time talking about how distance is becoming an issue in fucking 1920. They're talking about it. Here we are a hundred years later. And guess what? If those that could just hit the ball farther and straighter have an advantage, then they're better at the thing that we're doing. That's, that's an incredible skill. And it's not like you see the guy that just hits the farthest wins every single week. In fact, that's just not the case. And it's, you know, we went through the whole thing with Bryson. Yes, he was able to get a U.S. Open. He won at Wingfoot. It was great. He had a good run. He won some big events. He won at Bay Hill. He was trying to drive the green on whatever that is, the the half moon hole, like the fifth hole or whatever it was. He drove the green on the first hole at the Ryder Cup and people went crazy. That was fucking awesome. But It wasn't like he was just automatically winning every single event because it hit it farther. It wasn't like he went from not being able to compete at tournaments or majors to winning the U.S. Open. He was already really fucking good. And so he, of course, he won a U.S. Open. Yeah, that distance thing probably helped him, especially that week. Everyone was missing fairways. Everyone was hitting 30, 40 percent of fairways. His went farther. He was able to get it on the green. But his up and down, his putting. His ability to run it up at Wingfoot, which we talked a lot about, was a huge factor. He had to have a lot of skills other than just hitting it farther than everybody. So what I've come around on, and I'm learning again through a lot of what you just said and what Brandel just said of the systemic issues that would come from doing this would be pretty significant, pretty devastating. And the cost of it all would most likely fall on the consumer, which is everybody listening here, because... Like you mentioned earlier, and like Brandel's been harping on, if they decide to use a different golf ball, the equipment companies aren't going to be like, well, Taylor made, for example, not going to be like, well, here's the Stealth 2 that we designed to do this, and we're just going to stick with the Stealth 2. Fuck no, they're going to go back in hardcore 
to research and development. They're going to have Rory and Scotty and Colin and Fleetwood and all these guys come to them and say, hey, now that we got this new ball, I'm actually learning the characteristics of the ball. Yeah, maybe it flies 20 yards less far, but it actually favors a little bit more of a draw, a little bit more RPMs on this spin rate. So we need to get a driver that now is more conf- – you know, that's how they're going to play that game. TaylorMade's going to have to invest millions and millions and millions and millions into creating those clubs to conform not just for the you and me of the weekend, but to conform to Rory. Right. And, and then they can't and they can't turn around and sell those to market. They can't even sell those to market. They had to pay millions to optimize the performance for the top players in the game so that they still play tailor-made so that when somebody's holding up, you know, that trophy or wearing the green jacket that they've got tailor-made across their forehead. So they got to do that. They're a company. They're a business. So they're not just going to spend millions and millions and millions and not look for a, a, a way to increase revenue. How do you increase revenue if that's not going to market and all that? Well, they're just going to have to drive up prices. That's going to make everything more expensive for you and me and everyone out there listening and trying to buy it. All because guys think that like Cypress points a little bit too easy for guys that are hitting it, you know, as far as they are. Or maybe there's a few holes that they're going to have to move the tees back, which they have. They've done that. We're going to probably see in a couple weeks at Augusta the 13th, and they're going to unveil how the 13th hole is now however many yards longer. Of course, they're going to have to do that. But like you said, Games fucking change. The NFL is dramatically, dramatically different now than it was in the 70s or the 80s. It's it's infinitely bigger. It's done phenomenal things for the game of football on a business scale. We talked about how it fucking dominates the World Series now. The World Series has to schedule games around Sunday and Monday night football because football is so big. So the NFL is dominated in that sense. No one's saying that just because you're bigger, you get more eyeballs, that that's definitely the best way to go for the game all time. But I really do think when you add it all up, ever since COVID, millions of more people are playing golf. They're more into it. They're buying more merchandise. They're attending events. The ratings for the Players' Championship were very high, very solid. The game now is in a is in a great place, and it's a very unique, very unique game in that if you're a fan of golf, you play golf. If you're a fan of football or basketball, you don't necessarily go play football on the weekends. You play golf on the weekends if you're a golf fan. And I'll tell you this, it's not like the drivers that they're making or the equipment that they're making or the ball that we're using, as good as it is, I'm not going out to these golf courses and being like, well, I'm just hitting it too far. This place is too fucking easy. Boy, oh boy, I wish I had a four iron in instead of this fucking nine iron. Nope, nobody's doing that. And so it, it it does become a very interesting issue where is it just the people that think they know what's best for everyone doing it for themselves so that they feel like they did the right thing? or Or is it truly something that is... It, the onus should be on folks in power that we trust that even if we don't think it's something that's broken or necessary, that they see it better than we do. And that this move, even if it's unpopular to certain people, even if the equipment companies are pissed off about it, even if Justin Thomas goes out and says it's really bad, is it something that they're going to turn out that history says they were right about? Game Time, the exclusive ticketing partner of Barstool Sports, created by fans for fans. Game Time is a new ticketing app that makes it easier than ever to score last minute deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows, and they guarantee the lowest price. I got a text message from my sister two nights ago saying, What is the code for foreplay? Because I'm going to see The Lion King on Broadway. Whoa. And I would love to buy these tickets on Game Time. She she went on all these different websites and they were tickets of from three hundred and fifty bucks a seat to four hundred dollars a seat. She went on game time, two hours before showtime, one hundred and twenty bucks a seat. Oh. She used code four play, which got she used code four in the redeem code section. She got twenty dollars off her first purchase. I used and it all co- of a sudden that ticket's just a hundred bucks. Right, and I used it a couple weeks ago. Me and uh, Noah from Chicks in the Office, we went to Nas at Madison Square Garden. Used game time, got tickets. We're at the show. It was a great show. You can do these things too. Get out there. Start doing stuff. Not even kidding. That's a real life story, not an ad. It actually happened. I have the text messages on my phone. She saved $300 by picking game time over the other ones because it was just way cheaper. I think people believe you. The purchase process takes just two 
taps, and 10 seconds. Once you buy your tickets, they're delivered directly to your phone. No printer needed. The app also allows you to easily share tickets with friends via text so anyone can get into the game or event seamlessly. Skip the hassle and enjoy the moment. Download the Game Time app or go to the website, enter your email, and redeem code FOUR for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. That's Game Time app, code FOUR, F-O-R-E, $20 off your first purchase. I like your football analogy because I think it's a good one because football has changed dramatically, as you mentioned, not just commercially, but the game itself. The the rules have changed. There's way more passing than there used to be. And there obviously are purists who are older who are back in my day. We used to be able to hit the quarterback. And back in my day, you know, it was hard-nosed football. And we ran half that dive, you know, half the plays. And that's what it was. The difference here is that those people are in control of the rules. And so... I'm really interested to see what the PGA Tour does because obviously the PGA Tour right now has a, has the least amount of leverage they've ever had with players because there's a competitor. If the PGA Tour says, you know what, we're not going to adopt this rule because that's within their right. This is not a rule. It's a it's a local rule that you you know tournaments can choose to implement or not implement. You know, Liv will turn around and say, come come and hit bombs where we are. You know, screw screw the guys, screw those suits, screw those old gray haired guys with khaki pants and visors who are telling us what the future of golf should look like. I also think it was it was really a half measure. 15 yards. I mean, that's not gonna that's not gonna all of a sudden make a 6,500 yard golf course become a huge challenge anymore. Is 15 yards really gonna bring Cypress Point and, and Nash? You know, is that really gonna gonna revive their challenge? I don't think so. I just think it's very interesting that it it just seems like yeah that you know are are people watching golf watching the best players in the world apart from this small little bubble on golf twitter and saying this is ter- this is a bad product it was it was better before it was better when they were hitting longer clubs it was better when the ball spun more and if you look at the guys who want, who are the best players in the world right now or, or who won last year's majors you got Scotty JT Fitz and Cameron Smith I mean, those guys are, it's not just bomb and gouge. It's not. Scotty's got an unbelievable short game. JT shapes the ball more than anybody else on tour. Yeah. Fits even after the, the distance gain is, a, is around average. And Cameron Smith is known for his wedges and his putting. So it's, it's not like the game has been turned into this mash fest. I, I just, I just don't see, I just think that, I'm not, which is not to say that there's not a problem. I just think the negatives of the move outweigh the positives of the move because it's not done on an island. I think so, too. I think so, too. And, you know, look, there's certain shots, right, that I I would like to see the top players have to hit. You know, you'd like to see someone have to stand in the fairway on 11 at Augusta and have to hit like a towering four iron at the right center of the green in order to really get out of there with like a pretty easy par and a lot of times now the the top guys especially can bomb it pretty far down there even with the fact that they moved it way back you know you're watching guys that are oh he's got 211 in here and he's got a seven iron and you're just like well i mean a fucking seven iron and that's still a mid iron almost a short iron and and fine but again that is very few examples you still watch guys, you turn on the players' championship, and you watch guys hook the ball, slice the ball, miss and shoot a billion left and right, when, when it's shoot windy. a million. And right, when it's windy, when a course is that. So, and they've been playing that course since the 80s, and it's not changed that much. You can look at the photos, you can look at all of it. It's pretty goddamn much how Pete and Alice die. Uh, meant that place to play and here we are in 2023 and it's playing pretty damn similarly and so and guys are struggling and yeah there were what Hatton was 12 under Scotty was a million under there are a few guys at 10 and then everyone else was single digits under par on a golf course that's a par 72 if that golf course players championship TBC all guys that golf course were a U.S. Open they would make that puppy the second hole would play as a par four the 11th 11. hole would play as a par four, and that thing would be a par 70. Everybody is eight shots worse, and now all of a sudden, Scotty Scheffler, as great as he played, finished single digits under par on that golf course in an era where it was incredibly soft on Saturday, and everybody says that everybody's hitting it too hard and it's making these golf courses obsolete. That ain't fucking true, and that golf course isn't even that long And so for these guys. So I, I'm starting to very much come around on the fact that 
I think, yes, there are parts that you're going to be able to point to and complain about, and you're going to miss certain parts of the game, absolutely. And when I hear Tiger especially talk about how we had to shape it more back in our day, and he's probably exaggerating on that a bit, which I enjoy as well. But when he talks about that stuff, I do miss that. And I do think like, well, if we went back and did a whole year of golf when Tiger was healthy again and they had to play with equipment from like the late 90s, he would dominate everybody, and that'd be fun to see. But that is a very minimal thing to give up. And the other thing that is, I think, a big big focal point and a key element in the synergy between the amateur weekend golfer, the Joe and the pro is the fact that we get to go out there with the same equipment, the same ball, the same driver, the same planet, the same grass, the same air, and we get to try our hand at the same thing that the pros are doing. That's awesome. And we preach on this, tee it forward. You shouldn't go play a course from 7,500 yards. If you go play sawgrass, play it from 64, 65, have yourself a good time, whatever. But when you stand on that 17th hole and it's 131 yards to that back right pin, you're standing there with a pitching wedge or whatever it is, just like Scotty fucking Scheffler or Sergio when he hit it in the water twice in 2013 or Tiger or Ricky when he made birdie five times in that hole in 2015. So it's like that is so cool in the game of golf. And now we're going to be like, oh, you played 17. How'd you do? Oh, I hit a middle of green. Oh, are you using a pro ball or one of the, new, you know, it's like, oh, what? well, I was kind of used. I was in between. I ran out of pro balls. It's like, what the fuck? We bifurcation is not the game of golf. It's so cool that we get to go out there and compare ourselves. It's so cool that we get to watch Scotty Chef, or even even though people are ragging on me that I said it's more boring when somebody just wins down the stretch with a lead. They're trying to uh, uh, conflate that to me saying Scotty Scheffler's boring and I'm ragging on him. Not at all. I think it's unbelievably impressive what Scotty Scheffler's doing. You're just giving me the choice. I'm going to say I would rather see Scotty Scheffler have to make a fucking ace on 16 or chip in to take a one-stroke lead than have a six-shot lead down the stretch. And the shot on 11, 12, 13, 15, 16 doesn't really matter as much. That's just not as exciting to me. Anyways, the whole point being that I think in today's day and age, when you watch Scotty Scheffler stand up there and he hits a drive that he carries 317 yards into the wind a little bit and hits it dead straight down the middle of the fairway where there's trouble all over this all over the place, you yourself have that same ball, same driver, same ability to go get that equipment, to go use that equipment and see if you could do that. And when you do do it, when you do go play a tough hole, when you do go to Pebble Beach and you play the 18th hole, You've done a dream trip with your father or your buddies or whoever, whomever it is, and you step up to 18 and you hit a good drive and you hit a, a great layup down the right side and you're able to hit a little wedge in there to 15 feet and make a birdie. You played it identically to the best players in the world trying to close out a major championship, and that's awesome. And that, again, I think is just a, a pillar of the synergy between why the amateur game, the, the weekend golfer game the, is is – married to the pro game and i think by doing this you seriously risk losing that element of golf which which i think could be very damaging i think it could be very damaging i think we're going to have course records with the pro ball course records with the joe ball it's also a question of how far down does this go does does the ncaa's do this do are do you know do the kids start playing with with the pro ball do they start doing it in junior tournaments because they want to get used to it you know, and 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 the US, it just feels like the USGA did this and just didn't really care about the ramifications. I saw an interview on, I think it was on Golf Digest. One of the guys was saying, oh, there's no, you know, there's no um, requirement that the manufacturers make a ball. Of course there is. What do you think they're just going to, you think they're just going to let the, all these guys go to another company? They're like, oh, yeah, they, if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. That's just not at all how it works. Right. Um, and, and you know, you said, would it be nice to see Tiger hit or, or Scotty hit a, a four iron into 11? And like, yeah, I totally get that. Would it be great to watch a guy like Shaq? play with his back to the basket and just dominate someone down low. Yeah, that'd be cool. Would it be, would it be nice to see, you know, a uh, 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 running back at 400 carries in a year? And uh, yeah, that would, you know, so there's, there's people on both sides and it just right. feels like, I also think that there's a certain, there's a certain message that this sends and, and, and the message is, you know, the past was better. The, the, there was a bygone era where the, where the game was better. Um, and I think that's going to turn off a lot of people. It already has. And again, I'm not saying that Instagram polls are are gospel, but if you look at, at some of these accounts that have run polls, it's like 85% people saying, we don't like this. We don't want this. And it just seems like the USGA doesn't care. They feel like they know what's best. The, the, the people in the room feel like they know what's best for the game and they are going to determine the future of the game 
despite the fact that that they're on the way out mostly. I mean, th- these are not the people who are going to carry the game into the future. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm against it. You know, I, the best players in the world will still be the best players in the world. The the distance, you know, I saw Bryson just a just a total. I don't know what he was talking about. He said, "I'm for equality, but not for equity," which would seem to if, which is weirdly political, and also would seem to suggest that he thinks that they're trying to make everyone hit it the same distance, which is not what they're doing. I mean, no. I, I could be against the rollback, and I can still understand what the rollback is. It's not about one guy hitting it more relatively far than another. It's about, but yeah. I, all that said, I, again, I understand the other side. I, I just think, you know, the, the a phrase that kind of came out of the pandemic was the the solution can't be worse than the disease or the cure, the cure can't be worse than the disease. And I think that's kind of applicable here. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to lean that way. I really am. Trent Ryan, where's the golf capital of the world? Myrtle beach, Myrtle beach, South Carolina plays host to more than 3 million rounds of golf per year. And you listening and watching, you should be part of that number. Caledonia Golf and Fish Club and True Blue Golf Club and Myrtle Beach are Myrtle Beach's highest ranked golf courses and a must play. Both are ranked among America's top 100 courses you can play and located within minutes of each other. When we um, had the Barcelona Classic at True Blue just a couple weeks ago, you and I were there. I was talking to a couple of guys who are from New York and they said they moved down to Myrtle Beach like a year ago just because they wanted to play golf all the time. They were sick of New York winters, and they said their life has improved maybe 500% because they can just play different golf courses all the time. Dude, when we pulled through those gates of Caledonia, the awe that we were in, the awe of the natural beauty of the property. What were those? The Spanish moss trees. Those yeah. line the entryways. Beautiful water marsh views sit behind the clubhouse and rows of colorful azaleas. So great. You think you're in Augusta, Georgia. That's how nice this is. But you're also, you're, you're just in Myrtle Beach. Right. You know what I mean? You don't have to be in I had else. never seen azaleas like that except for on, uh, on TV. I'd never seen that before. I've seen them at Caledonia Golf and Fish Club. So make sure that you go to CaledoniaGolfVacations.com to book your tee times for a plan and stay package and get more information about two America's top 100 golf courses at CaledoniaGolfVacations.com. Make sure you go there. You're going to love these golf courses. True Blue and Caledonia are one of the best. They are two of the top 100 courses in America. Like you said, it's not gonna, uh, it's not like they're capping how, how, like everyone needs to hit at the same distance. That's just not the case. It's gonna, you know, in theory, this would roll everybody back the same amount and you're still gonna be X amount farther. So really, you're just doing it then at that point to, you know, I, I, I did describe earlier, like if you can't carry certain bunkers and all that, then it brings back strategy a little bit more and people do like that. I get it, but it doesn't apply as universally to every shot in the game as people think that it does. It doesn't just eliminate all skill from the game. Yes, the equipment uh, uh, and the technology advancements have have bundled things a little bit, but it's still, if you suck at golf, you suck at golf. And if you're the best player, you're the best player. I still believe that holds true. I still believe we've had an incredibly exciting run of a lot of events. It wasn't the most dramatic finish of the players, but guess what? The best player won. The guy that's won the most events over the last 13 months, the guy that's the reigning Masters champion, he was a hair away from winning the FedEx Cup last year. He's player of the year. He's the guy that's won a couple of times. He just defended at the Phoenix Open. He goes in. He dominates at the players. The best player is the best player. That course still plays great. He didn't shoot 35 under par. There the scoring were, average uh, on tour is 71. Like it's it's <laughs> right, not like these right. it's not like these guys are shooting 64 every single week and and everyone's crying out like this is ridiculous. It's still listen to the pros talk about it. The game's still plenty hard. And I and get and yes, I also with that admit that they've made some changes. Um, the agronomy, the greens are faster, and remember, and the roughs a little bit higher. The courses are a little bit longer. So what? Guess what? You have to do that at a few courses, relatively speaking, to the tens of thousands of courses in the world. You got to do that to a few of them. You got to push a few holes back occasionally. That I think the ramifications of that are far less than what they are proposing. And ultimately, I think I'm falling on the side of being pretty hard against it now again i'm still trying to learn i'm still trying to be as most educated as i possibly can about the whole situation 
Um, but I do think that just fundamentally, yeah, there's, you know, it, we all wish we could have everything that we want. But at the end of the day, I think the sacrifices or the negatives that exist from guys and the current technology and the ball, which, by the way, we are discrediting a lot of like the guys have just gotten more athletic. They've optimized things more. They've got full swing simulators and data, and they're just more optimized from their body to their techniques to everything to just hit the ball farther and straighter. That's pretty fucking impressive, by the way. <laughs> We're just like Yeah, people people like to that. watch that. People like to yeah. watch that. You know what I mean? Like we have to think about, you know, the the full swing Netflix show kind of made us step out of the golf bubble and be like, all right, w- w- you know, how does this look from a totally normal perspective? If we tell a fan, you know, the guys got good and the equipment got better and they started fucking launching it 330 and people loved it. And then we said, you know what? It's too far. They're hitting it, they're hitting it too far. We got to make them hit it less far. It's just like the average person is going to be like, well, that, that's lame. That's that's classic golf. Like, why why not just yeah. lean into the coolness that you have on your hands? It's incredibly cool. Guys are swinging fast. Watching Minwoo Lee hit his two iron like 300 yards and have 172 ball speed with that thing. That's fucking awesome. So I, I agree. Watching Bryson, like Bryson's stock was never higher than when he was – he when he drove it – almost on the green on that par five at Bay Hill, just right of it, basically. And he was going like this at the crowd. That fucking dork was getting that kind of hype level at a PGA Tour event from not just hardcore golf fans, but from all kinds of sports fans. And then when he drove the first green and made a fucking eagle at the Ryder Cup, like, are you kidding me? How cool is that? And so, so again, I get that there's some negatives and, 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 and some things that I wish were a little different. Fine, but overall, if I have to consider all things, which you have to in this situation, situation i think it's a no-brainer they just don't do it sure cap it which they've pretty much already done you got to be conforming to this and that cap it at this there's going to be a few guys every couple years that pop up that have figured things out a little bit more than the last guy and then people are going to copy that learn from it and the game's going to evolve like it always has like every game in the fucking world has and that's great good for those people doing things differently you know, like I said, optimizing their spin rates and tweaking equipment and and doing speed training and working really hard on their body and their fitness and all the sacrifices that they make for their nutrition just to be better and hit the ball farther. Good for them. I agree. Completely agree. Uh, all right. We have the Valspar Championship this week. Uh, we're going to throw it to Adam Scott here, but just in case you missed it, the myself and Kirk Minahan gambling show, we had a big week last week. I was up a lot. Uh, Kirk went... Really, we we kind of were talking about it on the show. It's not like we're gambling experts here, so you know, there's no format. We just kind of like, oh yeah, what are our picks? We pretty much, I would say, had four picks, two each that we very much were like, these are our picks. Three of the four of them hit, which was incredible. Uh, I made a good amount of money last week. Kirk really went like pretty much two for two. The Ryan Fox one got uh, the dead heat rule. Um, you know, the uh, mitigated the payout a little bit, but it was still uh, a solid payout. I had Tyrrell Hatton top 20. He finished solo second with a back nine 29. Um, uh, Kirk had Victor Hovland top 10. I think he finished tied for third. So we kind of were just, we're on, a, we're on a roll. The Keegan one was a miss, but we also were saying the Players' Championship is probably the hardest tournament to handicap all year. You got, you've never had a back-to-back winner. You get guys like Tim Clark and Webb Simpson that win the thing. Uh, you get Roy McIlroy misses the cut by a million. You just have no idea what's going on there. So for us to come out as winners was nice. This week at the uh, Valspar Championship, Kirk's really got – he came in with uh, with two picks that he felt solid about, and then he, he's got another one that he came in with, and then another one that he came up with live as we were discussing. He's got um, Brandon Wu, top 20 at plus 225. He's got Tommy Fleetwood, top 10 at plus 225. Then he's got, you're going to love this one, Dan, head-to-head, and he shouted you out on this, as you could imagine. Head-to-head, he's got Matty Fitz taking down Justin Thomas for the week at plus 105. And then he's got Davis Riley, top American, at plus 2,200 this week. Uh, again, those he's first in two, the weeds, dude. I'm impressed. Oh, big time. Wu and Fleetwood are his main picks. And then, like I said, he kind of talked himself into these last couple. He wasn't as confident about the Fitz over JT one, but... He said that was a value play because he just hasn't been that hot on JT this year, uh, and he thinks Fitz is going to take it's him fair. down. Fair, JT has been like T twenty machine. I told him I was kind of like, well, I think both of them has really kind of struggled, so I'm not obsessed with it. But he said JT was like minus one thirty, and Fitz was plus one hundred five, so he liked Fitz in that one. And then my picks, 
I just came in with two. I wasn't going to get talked into trying to pick a winner or stuff that I'm not feeling great about. My two are I got Adam Hadwin, top 10, at plus 275. He uh, finished tied for seventh last year. He was uh, tied for seventh, I believe, in strokes gained tee to green, which they always talk about this track, uh, the snake pit, the whole deal. You got to hit your ball very, very well. You got uh, uh, your ball striking is key. That's just one of those tracks. Made 10 out of 11 cuts so far this year, and he finished tied for 13th at the players last week, so a strong finish. And then Justin Suh, he's, he's just on my radar. I got him top 20 at plus 180. He finished tied for sixth at the players. Um, his finish is pretty much all spring, kind of like late – winter if you want to call it he's good have been yep really solid he's a great player that i think is only going to kind of continue to blossom so um so yeah adam hadwin top 10 that's plus 275 justin's uh top 20 plus 180 is what that comes in at and then kirk's got woo top 20 fleetwood top 10 he's got fits over jt head to head and then he's got riley top american which is his long shot pick at plus 2200 uh, all right, go check out the merch, okay? Store.barstoolsports.com. Go to the four play tab. We like when you buy our stuff more so than others, but any Barstool stuff's good for the company. We got a new spring line out there flowers, pink, green, fun. It's about to be spring wherever you're living. April's my favorite month, so get it hyped for that. Uh, next up, we got Adam Scott. So hit it hard. Hit it hard. Truly. Truly Vodka Seltzers, the brand new vodka with made with real fruit juice. We have been waiting for this for a long time. Yep. All the competitors, they had all this real vodka and all their drinks, and we're like, no, we love Truly. We're going to stand by Truly. They've been with us since the beginning of the Barso Classic. We're in year five now. We just kicked it off in Myrtle Beach and in Florida. It's going great. Fifth year of the Barso Classic. They've been the title sponsor. And then all of a sudden, in our fifth year, our, what, what do you call the fifth year? I know the 10 is decade. Uh, super senior? Super senior year? Is of it the Barcelona the Classic? Penult- p- uh, penultimate? Nope. That's second to last. Okay. So hopefully not. No, it's not. Um, in this uh, super senior year of the Barso Classic, they throw us the real vodka made with real fruit juice drink. Yeah, and they we like to keep it real. That's why they use no artificial flavors or sweeteners. We were blown away. Yeah, I mean, we go to a lot of these and... All of the reviews that we get from people who've been drinking them all day are like, these are the best seltzers I've ever had. So Made with premium vodka for a crisp, clean, and refreshing taste. Fewer calories. All 12-ounce cans have under 110 calories, which means plenty of refreshing flavor that won't weigh you down. They also have low sugar. Every single Truly Vodka seltzer contains only 2 grams of sugar. So... Find Truly Vodka Seltzer near you at trulyhardseltzer.com. Make sure you check the website. You're going to find out where they are. You're going to get the Truly Vodka Seltzers at trulyhardseltzer.com. All right, folks, we're joined now by a very special guest, first time on the show. He's a 14-time PGA Tour winner. He has won the Players' Championship, which we have to mention because we just had the tournament and we raved about it. He's a big part of one of the more iconic photos taken in the history of foreplay, which was on the Swilkin Bridge with Frankie Brilli yeah. <laughs> and a stunning sunset last summer. And he is, of course, a Masters winner, which oh. is incredible to introduce a human being as a Masters winner. Adam Scott. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Great to be with you guys. Uh, so where are you at right now? You're on like a little kind of vacation, staycation almost from the player's house, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a light week for me i've just done uh three of the last four on tour finishing with the players which is a big one and a couple of the new designated events so it's been a big month of golf some pretty tough tracks i haven't shot much under par lately (laughs) and i need to decompress a little bit so i'm gonna have a light week this week and then we get back into the match play uh a week off before the masters and then on to hilton head so there's another big month of golf coming What's your like? Uh, what's your hobby situation like? On are you playing pickleball? Are you watching like binging shows? What is your what's your kind of yeah. what are you gonna do to kill time? No, I'm definitely more into doing other sports. Uh, however, um, age is starting to be a problem with like soreness from other <laughs> sports. Like <laughs> it, there's kind of one one level too, and that's go. Like I was playing some paddle tennis and regular tennis, um, but I just get too sore now, and then it's hard recovering and i have three little kids and that takes tons of time too so um 
I, my passion is surfing though if i if i can if really? i can go surfing i'll You're go just surfing perfect man yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> what the hell's going on I, I like the water Cash. i like getting in the water but do do you when you surf do you get really sore i've never surfed and i don't know if i ever could but <laughs> when you surf do you end up sore <sighs> we the gotta next get day? you surfing dude i i'm just i'm just wondering because it seems like such a relaxing <laughs> activity but you do have to paddle out there yeah the paddling is the problem it's like anything it's like if i go and play uh pickleball or paddle tennis you get a little sore because you don't do it i don't do it that much like i don't surf that much anymore even though i like to so uh yeah you get sore but I can hack that on a Monday, Tuesday, and on off week, and then kind of work my way back into shape for the next week. Yeah, any bad wipeout surfing? I, I've found my limits, and that was like ten years ago. Uh, I I've met you know some pro surfers, and they don't think like normal people. They <laughs> take you out when you know they think it's all very mellow but it's like seriously <laughs> drowning you know, yeah. stuff for me and i was in hawaii and i found my limits there and like never never gone back there have again. you met kelly slater yeah so yeah i got to meet kelly like 20 years ago and we we kind of stay in touch uh, often and we play a lot of golf and occasionally get to surf and but he's a really good golfer uh and uh i've done some golf stuff with him that you can find online somewhere but he is seriously good he's like a scratch oh, wow yeah and uh he get, he kind of it when you get around guys like that who are like next level at what they do it it's quite motivating so you know even going to play golf with him you're like wow this guy you know he, he plays golf like he's going out to compete surfing he's nuts <laughs> uh do you take do you try to or did you used to try to bring that to surfing too i feel like it's hard for you probably to take a half-ass approach to something else yeah like i was probably way too serious with it for a while and i'm not even good i just but i got i just pushed it to get to a level where i feel like i can surf competently and then you know i tried to drown in hawaii that time and <laughs> i was like okay well this is that's enough i want to i want to live that yeah. uh, there's that um surfing documentary on hbo about kelly and his pack of friends i cannot think of the name of it it's crazy some of the stuff that they do is just wild so to think that you're trying to keep up with somebody like that is I follow one of the guys on instagram i can't remember his name he's got like the dreads and he does a lot of like that where you're running on the beach and you throw the board down and what's oh, the that skimboarding the skimboarding uh -huh. i mean some of these guys the, the stuff they can do on water is out of this world yeah they're, crazy they're wired different because you know, just to, to let go and go out there. That's and exactly that's the kind of stuff do. Kelly tells me. He's like, just let go. Just live a little. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm going to die. Yeah. You know? yeah. Right. I'm going to let go I'm and die. I'm to let go and live. <laughs> but, you know, I've been lucky to be friends. And Benji Weatherly is another good friend of mine who's a pro surfer. And uh, he kind of gets it that I'm not able to just go out there and charge big waves. But yeah, you're a rational person. with <laughs> so Somewhat. <laughs> but uh, they... Um, you know they're they're fun to be around and they love playing golf too. So many of the surfers really love playing golf. Julian Wilson from Australia, who is he's won the Pipe Masters. He's a good golfer as well, and I play with him a fair bit. The Pipe Masters, yeah, is that what it's called? Yeah, that's like actually it's kind of like the Masters of surfing. Come on. It's like the what Holy Grail tournament of oh, surfing. Shit. Okay, where's that, that green place in the coming? same place every? Yeah. yeah, at Pipeline in Hawaii on the North Shore. Wow, I can't believe we didn't know about this. The Pipe Masters. Yeah, I think that's in that. Like doc well, that documentary that I watched, it's it's oh, all yeah. in there. You probably know all. About it's it. an awesome documentary. I highly recommend it. We should like publicly say that we're going to cover the Masters, and then we go, we to, go to the Pipe Masters. Masters. Yeah. <laughs> Pitch great. up at the beach. We get there. a free yeah. trip to the Ma to Hawaii. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, so where are you at? I'm curious where you're at with your golf game and golf swing now, because we were talking about we just played a scramble match. We're not going to reveal the result. We're at the yards here in Ponte Vedra, which is fantastic. 12-hole, I believe the first 12-hole course in America, and then they have another three-hole, like two different, a three-hole course and a six-hole course. They have a six. There's 12 on the six, I believe. Okay. So yeah, Woodbush. nice. Yeah. At Woodbush. Uh, really, really cool spot. They got, like, pickle and all kinds of different activities, and they set us up here. So we played today, and we were talking on the course with you a bit about how for probably your whole life, 30 years now of, like, playing golf, um, the people have been telling you how you have the prettiest and most perfect golf swing, you know, that there is. Your lines are perfect. Aesthetically, it's perfect. You've won the Masters, so it's clearly perfect. 
now that you're in your kind of your low 40s and there's all this talk about distance or whatnot, where are you at kind of with your golf? Are you maintaining? You're still trying to gain? Where are you at with your golf? Swing? I think probably maintaining is the, the right word for me. I mean, I feel like my swing is my swing. Uh, and, you know, there are days when it feels like a perfect swing. There are days when it feels like shit <laughs> too. So uh, that's kind of golf. But I really felt like in the middle of last year, year i was like that's it i'm just gonna this is what my swing is i'm not looking to swing any different or nitpick uh any positions i'm gonna own my swing and uh and try and maintain because the reality is you can just look it's getting harder for guys in their 40s to kind of hold their spot on tour and uh the same for me but luckily i've really been injury free and i'm kind of got speed and i'm not struggling with any of that i feel like i'm doing all the right stuff like in that physical area away from the course so if i can maintain uh it's really comes just down to the confidence and and putting some results on the board and growing that confidence to compete because i still feel like you know i play out there last week i was playing with morikawa and who did i play with the first two days it was bad because I've forgotten who I play with. <laughs> I can't wait, Matt, like we another play. good player, another great player. He's just really showing yeah. right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. The memory's gone, but you know, everything Swing else is, is still good. good. Speed yeah. is still, still there. Good. Memory completely but, gone. Woo. But uh, you know, I feel like I watch. I watch most of them play, and sure, I don't bomb it like Rory off the tee, but I've got enough speed to be getting home on par fives and playing the modern game of golf. So I feel good about that. But it's really a confidence thing, and and just getting on a run still two in the bag i saw yeah yeah i've been kind of a little free to use whatever clubs i want for the last 18 months or so and uh pretty much had the stealth woods in for the last 12 months and then just two weeks ago i put the stealth two driver in at bay hill and that's gone really good for two weeks i hit way well not way more but i've hit more fairways the last couple of weeks and i've been averaging so that's been nice yeah um so having a little freedom there at this point in my career is nice to we've talked around. a good amount about that with uh it, it feels like in the last year or two more of the players are not everybody but more players are going to sort of choosing you know whatever they want for their bag rather than you know focusing on getting an equipment deal is part of that because the you know the prize pools keep going up so drastically that it's like if you can be a couple shots better even throughout the whole year you're going to make more money than you would by having a deal that's probably a big a big part of it it makes yeah. it it makes it easy to justify uh not doing a deal i think you know it's changed a couple of times throughout my career but it's got to, it got to the point where generally most companies um you know want 13 or 14 clubs in the bag if they're going to pay you good money they want the exposure right, right. and uh you know for them to make 13 or 14 clubs that perfectly suit you is is pretty tough when there's a lot of options and different technologies out there so you know it's pri- whatever the priority is for the for that guy and you know I've had an incredible relationship with Titleist for like 24 years and it's still the only company I'm contracted to play and I play the ball um but you know, just to have a little wiggle room here and there for me at this point, I think is important. And, uh, you know, make sure I'm going out there with the stuff that I'm absolutely confident with. Confident in your, uh, in your Browns. We've talked about you, <laughs> you showed up in some color today and that was a nice, that was, that was a nice sight. But a surprise. It was a surprise. <laughs> well, it's been an ongoing conversation on this podcast that Adam Scott became the earth tone golfer. And I, mm-hmm. and I said, not that that's a negative thing. It's just your thing now. And yeah. I actually really, I, I like the fact that when you see you, when we see you, you're wearing like the Browns. Yeah, I don't disappoint. No. Sure. No. It, <laughs> Where did yeah, that come from? <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, I guess it was Riviera last year. It was pretty cool all week and I wore the same beige sweater every day and I didn't think much of it, but someone picked up on TV or, or yeah. social media or nice. something that I was Definitely. in it again and again and again. <laughs> and then... Uh, I don't know whether it was. I had an AJGA Junior event I hosted on the Monday out there, and I wore it More again beige. for that. <laughs> and it, you know, it got a bit more buzz. So then I thought I'd really, you know, milk it. And the media thing I did the next day, I wore it again. Yeah. So oh, then yeah. it really became a thing, and I saw the memes and yeah, stuff yeah. like of me with a big long gray beard. Yeah. At yeah. 110, still wearing, still wearing the beige. Yeah. So. 
I like, I, yeah, I'm never sure, like, if somebody like you, because you're chill, you're mellow, you don't seem, like, overly plugged into the social media thing, if you even knew about that at all. Like, I could see you showing up just in these beige every week being like, <laughs> this is what I like, this is great, yeah. and having no idea that there's memes and stuff going on out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I seriously don't uh, take that stuff too seriously at all. I think it's fun if anyone wants to have yeah. some good poke fun at me. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> but... uh you know, I, I've been lucky uh, as well to be sponsored by Uniqlo. And, you know, yeah, okay, they probably, they make more than just a beige sweater. I got to, <laughs> but, but I'm a sweater guy. I play in a sweater all the time. You so, look great. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm never going to say you don't I, look great. That's a fact. I mean, yeah, you look so, great. You know, I'm lucky to have good good sponsorship from them and, and they send me good clothes. And I did wear a beige sweater like seven days in a row. But, you know, <laughs> so that's good. the one I have with me that week. <laughs> You talked about his social media. I mentioned a couple months ago that someone must have taken over your social media or something because you've been doing a whole new version of the way you show like your week. Like mm-hmm. you'll you'll be showing a lot more practice rounds and everything has a different aesthetic. I think it's really cool what you're doing. It's like a whole yeah. new look into your the way that you play and the way that you prepare. So I think you guys are doing a great job. I actually mentioned it. And then I took you like to make the cut one day because I I knew something was changing in your game and your and your group. And then you played really well that week. I was like Adam Scott's like getting back go. in the mix. Yeah, but you know I'm I'm trying to embrace it. You know I come from a, the Stone Age compared to some of these young guys. But I think there's you know I try and keep it pretty professional because that's what I'm putting out there and uh, trying to give some insight into what I do and do it in the style I like as well. And I have a great team who uh, are embracing that as well. I mean, I think they try and push me for more and more and maybe they'll get there eventually. <laughs> but but we, uh, we're, I'm happy with how it is and it's, and it's fun to kind of, you've got to move forward. Yeah. That's the main thing. Everything's yeah. moving forward and, and I want to be on that train. Trent, are you looking for meals that are ready to eat? You see how I did that? Yeah, no, I am looking for meals that are ready to eat, are you especially for, healthy ones. I was just asking if you were looking for meals. But I'm looking... <laughs> I know why you asked it that way. You looking way. for meals, Trent? I'm looking for healthy meals that are ready to eat. You looking for meals that are ready to eat, delivered to your door, and actually help you feel your best? There we go. Sakara is the answer, and it's so much more than just a meal delivery program. I've used Sakara, honestly. I think that it's... There's all these different brands that do this, and Saqqara has been by far the best one that has been sent to my house. This food was so fresh, yep. so easy to make because you just pot- it had all the instructions. Put this in the pot, you simmer this, you steam this, you put these together. The food feels like you just made it with the best, most professional chef of all time. Meanwhile, it was just you. Yep. Really nutritious, makes you feel like you're eating really well, you're feeling best, you're your best, and you're eating healthy. Saqqara delivers science back plant rich nutrition programs and wellness products right to your door they're ready to eat meals and designed to deliver results from increased performance to boosted energy and right now sakara is offering our listeners 20 percent off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash four and enter code four at checkout that's f-o-r-e that's sakara s-a-k A-R-A dot com slash four, F-O-R-E, to get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash four. And in that same area, you've got the Fair Game app that you came up with during COVID, which is social media meets and putting your scores. How did you come up with this idea? Yeah, it was me and a couple of friends and time to killing COVID and, uh, They'd kind of had successful businesses, so that's good because I have <laughs> been a golfer, you know, and I don't know anything about the digital world. Successful golfer. And a successful yeah. golfer, but 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 their opinions about the game were really, really fascinating to me because I'm so deep inside, you know, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees, and one of them was just getting back into golf and really struggling to, like, get connected and get in and meet people, and so we tried to put something together that, can really cater for all that everyone can everyone can benefit from and hopefully some people will connect and communities will be formed on this thing because it kind of is the future we live in these phones and devices and um i feel like that's been lacking a little bit with golf so you know we're just 
we're pushing it out there, but it's really kind of there to grow organically. It's I don't know what it'll turn into. I like, that's a very good idea because we, you know, even with our follow, we have a, a Facebook group uh, with the kind of the four play fans on there. It's got three or four thousand followers. And I see people posting there a good amount of like, I'm going to be in this place. I only have one other guy. Like we need yeah. people to play with. And then even with our buddies, we all have kind of our own group text within our friends. And anytime somebody's playing golf or a couple guys are playing golf in that group, then not everybody is. We all want updates. Like yeah. we want updates constantly. Like who's winning the match? What's everybody shooting? People yeah. post pictures of scorecards. So if that's naturally kind of embedded into an app, it just makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Sure. That's the fun thing for me. Like, the one thing I wanted to see was how my buddies were playing back in Australia when I'm over here. And, you know, I can't see that on anything, but right. I get notified when they tee off and I get to see their round live you know, really scores cool. going in. And uh, we do the open game thing as well, where you can just show up and reach out to any other fair gamers out there if there's a round going, if you want to make up a foursome or something. So, you know, ho- hopefully, uh, you know, people get interested in it and. I think there's some good things to come. We've got some good plans for the future with it, so keep when an you, eye on it. When you get back home, do you do you play like casual rounds of golf with your buddies quite a bit? A little bit, yeah. I like I like casual golf, and I like kind of going to local clubs and not having to use the driver on every hole, and you know play play big golf courses. I like you know experiencing golf, and I think the one thing I miss playing on the tour all the time is like the home club you know the relaxed kind of atmosphere and it's your home club and um we play pretty demanding golf courses week in and week out and to relax on the course is kind of fun for me we said it's a bizarre world in which the amateur gets to play the better golf courses than the pro in the sport right like we get to go to all these ridiculous places that you probably won't even hit until after you're fully retired right it's a very bizarre it's not yeah, like, like a lot of the resort places band right. and cabin, and cabin, or, cabin. Yeah, like whatever. you're not seeing like we talked to kisner bags like yeah i don't even know what you guys are talking about right. it's cool online it's like yeah well, we just go there all the time because yeah. That's just like what it's built for. <laughs> Lucky you guys. That's what it's built for. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's crazy guys. that it He's is like, that who are these But like you watch baseball and like I can't go play at Yankee Stadium. Like right. it's very bizarre that the, the lower level people have more access essentially with their schedules than yeah, that, the top of the game. That's a cool way to look at it. I think, I mean, there's so many great things about the game yeah. that, that things like that can happen. I'm, there's lots of other stories, but I'm I'm pretty big golf nerd. Like I'm, in, I'm into the new courses and seeing what's around and I've, I'm, Went to Cabot a few years ago. There you go. There you go. And uh, check some stuff. Check some stuff out. So I try and go at least one, maybe two places or trips uh, during the year because we're great. moving around a fair bit. And totally. like, it's not that big of an effort to have a little detour and play some it's golf. It's nice to hear that because you hear a lot of golfers that like don't like to play for fun. Yeah. And like it becomes a job to them. And it's cool that you still like to seek that stuff out. Well, I've kind of been there too. Like, I feel like I've I've been out on tour a long time. I've had phases in my career, but there was a, there was a point, and I remember it clearly, where I changed my attitude. Actually, I was with one of my surf buddies in Hawaii, and we went out and played golf, and we might have had a few bevies on the course as well. <laughs> and like, hang on, this is so much fun to play socially. When I was at the time, I was like not playing with my parents, not playing with my friends. I'm like job, 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 right. and that really changed for me. And that was I don't know ten or twelve years ago, and I've really enjoyed the social golf since. When you like tip a few back, are you are you a beer guy? Are you like a scotch guy? What do you usually like to get into? Uh, yeah, I like beer and I like uh, whiskeys, you know, bourbons, whiskeys, stuff like that. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my thing. Um, but in Australia, we kind of <laughs> grow up drinking beer. So <laughs> that's, that's it's a lot uh, of us in the Midwest, too. That's yeah, kind of nice, just people nice. just drink beer. Yeah, I think Australians and uh, a lot of Americans kind of get along well together. We were blown away when we were there. So we were there for the President's Cup in 2019. Yeah. All of us first time and all of us admittedly not particularly cultured. So we didn't really know what to expect. And we've been to a couple places, but, you know, getting there... It was insane. It felt how similar it was and, and the culture was. And maybe it's because we were like all the Aussies that we met were pretty much like, you know, white golf dudes like us that like <laughs> liked the same shit that we like. But yeah. it was, that's how big NBA was. Mm-hmm. Everybody, all the guys were asking us about NBA. I guess the NBA comes on over there around like noon from right. the night before yeah. at, around that time of year. And so people were really into NBA. It felt like a lot of the restaurants were similar restaurants and it felt pretty similar to over here. For sure, yeah. I mean, I think we follow, you know, the U.S. sets the pretty much 
the culture for the western world and australia is such a young country we don't have our own culture you know we're only 200 and something years old so we're looking for it of course uh the uk has been an influence because we all kind of came from there as prisoners of it a long time ago and then <laughs> that's true that, is it yeah that oh, is yeah. us we were all the uh convicts yeah sent down to that island i think they got it wrong because what an interesting is like god's country i know (laughs) yeah they did get it wrong yeah yeah. they just didn't know what they were missing that's right they didn't know what was down there but we we so every ancestor of australia is essentially been convicted of something by the uk originally originally yeah originally yeah wow the first fleet that went down there were all convicts do you know what your like bloodline did wrong um (laughs) No. What a question. <laughs> what a question. I don't know. Great really, I'm, like, I'm, I'm really, you know? I, I'm not, I haven't done that family tree <laughs> stuff. 23 and me. Uh, trying to figure out. Yeah, they know. do. Could have been something stupid. No, no. Like you punched like a, like no. a bartender or something. Yeah, there's like, been. you're getting out of here. What's the movie with Will Smith where that happens when he like takes Pursuit the, of Happiness? Hitch. Oh. Hitch. He takes her oh, on the yeah. date and they go to like Ellis Island. And he's oh, like, yeah. I wanted you to look up your family history. And it's literally like a rip. She goes, she's like crying. She's like, we don't talk about it. It's probably like that. And he's like, oh, shit. It's exactly what out of control. It's unreal. What a cool place. We loved it. I loved absolutely it. loved it. It was, yeah. it was a great event. Like I thought the yeah. pres- that President's Cup for me is like one of the memorable events of my career. We lost, but it was a huge home game. It felt like totally. really the support was on our side because usually when the Americans have traveled to places, they've never the people have never seen them before. So when Tiger goes to Korea oh. or someone, you know, they're so excited to see the American players. Right. And like, that's our home game. And <laughs> we're like, can we get some claps too? <laughs> uh, but that really felt like that it was on our side. And uh, I think everyone had a good time. It was a great event. Of course, the Americans won. And, uh, but it's memories for me were really strong of playing that home game. So Tiger events, playing at his level too, like in yeah. that must have made it just cooler, right? Like the fact oh, yeah. that like he was at the top of his game right there and it made it so competitive and you guys had such a young team that was like rallying around each other. Hey, the answer was, went crazy oh that week. He was yeah. like lights out that week. Yeah, Storylines, like Yeah, guys were really lifting on our team, I think surprised a lot of people and um you know, but that's a deep, the American team's deep every year and uh, somehow we just don't get over the hurdle. But, you know, I, I think everyone had the best time. I'm glad you guys had a good time back in Australia and hopefully you get the chance to go back and play a little more golf down That there. event, I will say, so we've been, I've been to two Ryder Cups and then a couple of President's Cups. I went, the first Ryder Cup I went to was in Paris in 2018 and we, U.S. got killed. And the last one was at Whistling Straits. That one was unbelievable. But I would say that the President's Cup in 2019 in Melbourne was the second best team event I've been to by far. It was it was it was crowd wise and everything more electric than the Ryder Cup that was in Paris. And I think a lot of the reasons you're talking about it's such a golf culture in yeah. in that area in Australia in general, and that people I think you're right. The people weren't necessarily when Tiger walked around in awe the whole time of Tiger. Like sure, a certain element yeah. of people are, but they were more like no, they got, it. they got it. They got it for the week that like they needed to cheer for the international <laughs> this time, <laughs> right. which was great but um you know melbourne's like the sport capital of australia every every big sport thing we have is in melbourne and uh including our great golf courses oh the golf there was nuts. balls are bouncing yeah. all over the place it was crazy we weren't used I to was that not used to that <laughs> we uh so do you are you a, a kangaroo eater do you eat kangaroo do you like when you do eat? uh no i don't eat a lot of kangaroo yeah we no. tried it once and we were a little like weirded prosciutto. out by it, was, it yeah thinly sliced it was pretty well, damn good yes. oh you had like kangaroo carpaccio yes or something? that's exactly oh, yeah. yeah right it was good but it was a, it was it just felt i don't know it felt what weird courses did we play down there kingston heat kingston uh, yeah, that's we, my favorite. Yep, Kingston. Heath. We played, played that fresh off the plane. Fresh like, off the plane with yeah. with like Jello legs. Yeah, that's got a off a twenty four hour flight. That place beat us up. Legitimately for sure. yeah. got changed in the parking lot. That's how much right off the plane we got. Right. And then we went over and we uh, we played that new spot that had been uh, redone. Oh, remember that one? It has like twenty seven Kingswood. 
Yes. He did play Peninsula Kings. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Of course. That's you know. a ridiculous. Uh, I'm looking at him like, how I can't cool believe he knows. Clubhouse <laughs> like, behind who that would green. Know? He would the know. Clubhouse was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool spot. And then we went down and we played, uh, we went to Tasmania and played oh, yeah. Barn Boogle. Yeah, that's nice. And then, uh, and then I think that was it for you guys. And then I flew to King Island and played. Oh, you did? The King yeah, I haven't I been did. over there yet. That was insane. Yeah. Cape Wickham. Uh huh. Cape Wickham. And then yeah. the other one's like Ocean Dunes, I think right. that's there. And those were both. Cape Wickham might be. The most spectacular golf course I've ever seen. It's yeah. ocean, like pretty much 360 the whole time. I will say, very, I was very scared of snakes the whole time because you hear a lot about snakes, but everywhere all over that island, they mm-hmm. have one under his ball in the bunker. I had to hit out of a bunker next to a <sighs> that snake. Crazy. That was scary. Like, like a black snake. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was scary. Where was that? Oh, that was that at was Barn, Barn Boogle. Boogle. That was Barn, oh, Boogle. Barn Boogle. Yep. Yeah. And we sent Where the, the devil keeps its pets. Isn't that what they say? I think so. I don't know. I think might say that about Australia in general. I'm not sure. But they <laughs> well, the, that the, the, the snakes were like ridiculous. That one, yeah. We sent the video of you hitting with that snake, and someone's like, "Oh yeah, if that snake, that type of snake bites you, you have like 20 minutes, and then you're mm-hmm. over. Yeah. So I would just sit down yeah. and be like, "See you guys later." <laughs> yeah. That's all. That's all she wrote for me. <laughs> yeah, that's. All I had a great shot. Actually. You don't mess with the snakes, and you don't look for balls in the bush. At home that's right. Right. You just kind of let them go. There. Yeah, yeah. That's what we did the whole trip. I think we just said like it's just a take a drop. Yeah, we're not going in there and looking for balls. We get to play all these cool courses, but then you get to play Augusta National, which is coming up. And I asked you on the course today when we were playing our match, like, is it still cool for you to show up there, play your practice rounds, just get on property? Are you just so excited that this is coming up again? Yeah, it's a great time. Of year for sure. It's something about it. I mean, it's like that magical place it's like a bit like disneyland for a golfer love that you know, it's a big disney, disney guy. Yeah, yeah it is it's disney. like when you're going in you know you're going in there you know i got and it i know what's out there pretty much sense. all the time but mm-hmm. i but it's still to see it it's like almost seeing it for the first time again uh good it's you know hair on the back of your neck stand up and there are reminders all the time like last year one of my best buddies from australia he came over for the first time ever and he's a couple of years older than me, but we grew up playing golf together. He's a club professional at home. First trip in there. Tears in his eyes every day at Augusta National. Every yeah. day. He was there for a week. Amazing. He was crying on Sunday. Seven days straight. <laughs> you know, like, probably because it was over, but, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's, it is incredible like the effect it has on people when they you get ref- there. It's a big deal in Australia, Augusta National. It, it's this. It's, it's idolized over there as well. Yeah, it's, it's the event that's, uh, gone beyond the game of golf you know it's it's sports it's even you know people know the masters in australia have you ever found yourself in like the wrong spot at augusta national like walking around the wrong corner or, like entering the wrong room we always like Pro- have this mystique almost like disney where it's like those hidden tunnels you <laughs> yeah don't see. there probably is hidden <laughs> tunnels around the place I-, I think i feel fairly relaxed there now but you just never know when you're doing the wrong thing there there are some rules <laughs> that's you know you got to follow the rules yeah you don't want to get kicked out no the barstool sports book our favorite sports book on the planet absolutely it's the only place made for stoolies that you can find exclusive picks and parlays from big cat dave for play. Yeah, we do. We do for the cup bet. We do other ones. For the cup bet is a is a historically solid bet for us that we've been giving out winners and we've been giving out losers, but we've been giving out yeah, more winners. Yeah, we've been doing all right with that actually. I enjoy doing the for the cup bet. Me it too. makes everything exciting. Yeah. And this March, exciting time of the year. Kick off the action of March with a $100 sign up bonus from the Barstool Sportsbook. You sign up today using code TURNEY. Tourney? Tourney. T-O-U-R-N-E-Y. Depends on how you want to say it. Then place a $10 or more cash wager on any college basketball bet. Win or lose, receive $100 in bonus cash. So download and create an account today. Be sure to use the code Tourney and to unlock your $100 in bonus cash. Barstool Sportsbook lets you bet however you would like with daily odds boosts, live in-game markets, move the line and teaser bets, and Parlay Plus for awesome same-game parlays. iCasino is also available in select states with your favorite table games and slots. So download the Barstool Sportsbook and create an account today and be sure to use code TOURNEY to unlock your $100 in bonus cash. You must be 21 plus. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. (laughs) 
Uh, Tiger said that he's a, he thinks that the uh, Champions Dinner this year could be a little tense, a little different than it's ever been. Do you have any like any angst or any exi- like, anxiety you going in? Breaking this year? up brawls and <laughs> yeah, you might have breaking, with, like, a breaking chairs over get, people's backs. Yeah. Wear like a referee like... jacket instead of a green jacket <laughs> yeah, this year. Could, maybe um, <laughs> for, not for me, but I can understand. You know, there are some people who are fired up over the over the kind of divide that's going on yeah and uh it it is interesting because you know there's a lawsuit going on that involves players and on both sides of it and that's weird and i'm glad i'm not involved in any of that um i i hope there isn't a bad vibe you know we got to remember it's scotty scheffler's night and uh, he deserves to have the great a great night and every year i've been in there you know i feel like we all respect each other's accomplishments of what we've been able to achieve at the Masters, and you know he should be able to feel that too. Not, not guys, you know, throwing daggers at each other. Does he make a speech to the to the he's, table? He's, he should have. He, he, he will. I think he will. Everyone else has. I uh, can't see him being the guy that will like ignite a, a a riot. You know what I mean? You know, I can't see Scotty throwing out a dig at anyone. Do you? He gets up there and does like a model. Like I, I don't. I don't think he does so. Like but, a, you know, it's a maybe, roast. Maybe, maybe, I else, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe I can egg someone else to throw something. Maybe I can egg someone else on to throw something out there. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody walks in, you just boo him. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> on the table already. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think. I think before we get the chance to maybe the maybe the chairman, uh, Chairman Ridley will. Maybe address things and keep us calm for the That's night. That's a good point, you know. actually. Who do you usually sit next to? I always sit next to Trevor Immelman on my left. We kind of played golf since we were teenagers, traveled the world together a little bit. And uh, as soon as I won, the first year you sit up the head of the table when your host, like Scotty's going to this year, and then you got to go find a place. And I kind of went straight down to where Trevor's corner of the table is. And on my right side, most of the time is Mark O'Meara. Um, and it's not like reserved seating or anything, but a lot of guys do end up sitting in the same same spot. So then Tiger sits next to him, and Jack sits the other side of Tiger, and it's a wild it's a wild. I, it room. sounds it's like the there's best. kind of a signed seating hair like, on the back of my neck. Well, I just got those that guys too. do. You don't <laughs> yeah. sit in their seat, that's for sure. You know that as it goes up toward the head of the table that way, you don't mess mess with that. But you know, there's some movement down around my end. Yeah, we've gotten close to Trevor, and he is. He's just the best. Yeah. He really is. Yeah. He's the nicest guy. The We've nicest got a video guy. coming out next week. Is it going to be Wednesday? Probably. Yeah. Wednesday or Thursday, he teaches me how to putt. So I'm doing oh, this yeah. Fixing Frankie series. I did it with Dr. Brett McKay with the mental. Yeah. And then we did uh, Scott Fawcett with uh, Decade Golf. And then episode three is Trevor Immelman teaching me how to read putts and we, putting to a straight line and really mm-hmm. going through the process. We did a little bit of the aim point with you today on the golf yeah. course. So it's cool to see all those different variations of how to read a green, how to really think about your putting. But Trevor couldn't have been a nicer guy throughout that whole entire process. We yeah, went and down he, there and he just was so into it. He's Yeah, he is. He's so passionate yeah. about golf and everything he does. And, you know, he was a passionate player. And uh, <laughs> what was it like playing against him as a team with with the team? Well, you guys were playing since you guys were teens. You said, oh, right? oh yeah, like, since we he, were teens. He, he was good. Fire? He was way better than me. Really? Oh yeah. <laughs> he he was like a little phenom. Uh, he was like this miniature Ernie Els at sixteen and seventeen, just playing like a tour pro. We were all slashing it around, and you know nothing was refined or honed. And he was like a mini tour pro. And he had a year, and I forget which year, but he was still a junior, and he he nearly won the British Amateur. He was he was just dominating ev- everything, and uh, you know, so it was unsurprising that he he became a great player and went on to win the Masters too. Um, but like even now, when with his TV stuff, he's so put together and really like is. thoughtful with everything. Is. The job he did for us as the President's Cup captain is mm-hmm. just taken taking that role to the next level i don't know if i even want to do it after what he did for the team <laughs> last year you know i can't think about it i'm better off just playing wow uh where so you know we talked about the how the masters is is obviously coming up um i'd be remiss if i didn't ask you about you know when you won 2013 in the last few holes i mean the the year 72nd hole the playoff hole, uh, some gigantic putts that you made, and maybe one of the one of the biggest double fist bumps that's ever mm-hmm. been released <laughs> in in history. What are kind of what's your memory of those that last you know half hour hour of getting it done? 
Yeah, I remember a lot of the last, like from the 15th on, I feel like I can I can still feel what was going on. Before that, not so much, a little bit, but it's it's cool to be able to think I still can feel what was happening, but it was intense. I've watched a couple of times, uh, you know, the last few holes. And, I, you know, I love listening to me and Steve talking on like the 72nd hole in the fairway, like the intensity and the delivery of our um, conversation is just so good. And, you know, it's so critical. It's like you've got to hit a good shot or you're wasting this chance. And um, then obviously I kind of acted like I won the Masters when that putt went in on 18. But it felt like it. It felt like, you know, that's the putt to win the Masters. When mm-hmm. you're a kid, you're throwing balls on the putting green. Yep. It was the O'Meara putt, you know, oh. when I was a kid when he made that. And uh, so, you know, off I went off <laughs> <laughs> and then had to play a couple more holes. But that that was intense too. But the weather was changing heaps. Like it was getting way heavier, like in that half an hour between 72 and the playoff hole. All of a sudden, the like ceiling came down. It was the colder, the ball was going shorter. You know, there were some adjustments and Cabrera and I both hit pretty good shots in and they both came up short, um, you know, so it was it was touch and go and he hit a chip and my heart stopped because it rolled right over the edge of the hole <laughs> on that first playoff hole and that just would have been, uh, I don't know how I would have handled that one. <laughs> Had that going, you know, people chipping in on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, huh. A little tease, but little tease. Uh, on the on so on the tenth hole, is it true that you pretty much handed the wheel to to uh, Stevie to kind of read that one? Well, we we were both reading it and uh, doing our usual routine, and you know, like I said, I I enjoyed watching like our comp- our routine was so good at that point. We'd refined it, and we'd both read it, and I came back and said i i think it's a cup because i always kind of s- said what i think first and and he's like adam this is breaking more than that it's two cups and like that's a big difference that's yeah. not just like oh it's just a little bit more than that it's like twice as much as you see <laughs> and i think i said something like are you absolutely sure have you ever seen this putt before wow. he's like adam it is absolutely two cups and you know that's why he's had a lot of success because he'll put it all on the line he wasn't like going to split it with me he's like it's two and so i played it two and it went in the left (laughs) side but it went in (laughs) and and then you won the masters with that but yeah that's crazy that was it it's yeah that was it and it had to go in because it was there was no more golf to play that night it was it was dark it was I, I don't know how we would have slept and played a playoff the next morning. That would have been the worst. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's such the a, one. they got to go in. You it's know? a gutsy call by him. Be like, it is. Nope, it's Duke yeah. Cups. That, you. But, you know, that he, he's, had in, he's caddied for great players, but he's had incredible su- success because he backs himself as well. You know, just like a player at some point has to back himself to hit the big shot. He, right, he makes. He's not afraid to make the big call in what he believes, and that's why he's good. I can't imagine what it felt like when it comes to nerves as you're heading to the playoff. Were you surprised that you were able to handle it? Like, did something click in your brain, being like, "I can do this with everything on me." The cameras turned to me, all the fans knowing I'm in this. Like, to me, I'd puke all over myself. But then <laughs> I would assume that, like, I would there would be a moment where it's like we can get through this. What was that moment for you? Was it like just getting the ball back up uh, in the air? Yeah, I think it's surprising like when you watch, I'm more nervous watching like a buddy or or anybody kind of closing out a tournament than when I'm out there because I'm not in control and I'm more in control when I'm out there. I think starting the day like on a big day like that, even though I was behind, but there's a chance to win the Masters. I think you're way more nervy going out there. And then you have four and a half hours of like settling into your routines. And I think I was pretty settled and like to me it's a pretty good spot like 90 guys started this week and it's down to two and yeah. i'm one of them this is good opportunity now <laughs> yeah, true. You know, it's going well it's yeah, yeah this is good it. you know so i i good. feel like it's all positive at that point and uh i've played some playoffs before and mm-hmm. i've i've won some before and you know this is a good chance and i i think you you're way more calm because you've been out there for hours than of course, there's a little bit of nerves, but they're very manageable at that point. Yeah. 
That's amazing. That's just such a cool story. I can't, you know, I mean, nobody, nobody listening, really, none of us here will ever be in a position no. where <laughs> you even get to. Unless Trevor's listening, he'd be yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah like, I didn't even need a playoff. Yeah. Yeah. I just picked <laughs> everyone's house that, that week. <laughs> I just won it. I didn't Tiger's just like yeah. chilling, just listening to this, being like, what? I don't know what the fuck these guys are doing. Oh, well, seems unlikely. He's making it hard for himself. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, Adam makes it hard for himself. <laughs> <laughs> What's that guy talking I won like five of them. <laughs> 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 Shit. Amazing, amazing. Well, uh, well, yeah, we really appreciate everything. I mean, today's been incredible. It's been a full day with us, and we just can't thank you enough for that, man. No yeah. This, this had happened a great so time. quickly, and your whole team's amazing behind the scenes. Like, I mean, I, I just can't believe this whole day just like came out of nothing. So, you yeah, were thanks, guys. For really nice it to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for spending the time. Hope you have a good, you know, kind of week off with the family, and then it's uh, and then it's go time. A couple of big yeah. events, including the Masters tournament, where you'll obviously you're going to arrive there as a, a, a Masters champion for the rest of your life. Which is yeah, that's a that's a nice <laughs> a nice thing to think about. But it is a good time of year to kind of show up and play some good golf as well. <laughs> this is the time of year to do it. So. Unreal. Well, I'm thank ready. you, Adam Scott. Well, it looks good under green again is tan that's right you know that might be the <laughs> thing be to it. go beige this, this beige year, and baby. green you gotta get there through the go. masters Woo! wearing it at least yeah. that's you're good. wearing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are <laughs> you really are on both sides yeah all right thanks again thanks thank again, you Adam. you got it guys thanks, thanks.